Welcome to Revved Up for Sunday, everyone. We're the clergy of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. I'm John Kennedy. And I'm Peter Walsh. We've reached Labor Day weekend. Here we are at the end of the summer, proper 17. We're in a major controversy in the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus dismisses all Jewish dietary laws and what is unclean and clean in the sight of God. And nobody likes it, not even his disciples. So let's hear the text. This is Mark 7, verses 1 through 8, 14, 15, and 21 to 23. When the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders, and they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're returning to Mark after a long uh, venture through John chapter 6, the Bread of Life discourse, but we're sort of, actually, literally are picking up exactly where we left off, and uh, the way that the lectionary is structured means that um, the the Bread of Life detour uh, was actually not much of a detour, because it happens at roughly, actually kind of exactly the same moment in Jesus's ministry as we're, um, as we are in Mark. So the feeding of the 5,000 has just happened, um, the walking on the water, and this is not the first time that Jesus has uh, had some sort of confrontation or dispute with the Pharisees, but I think it's fair to say this is the most intense it's been so far, and the most uh, theologically substantive, we might say, in terms of um, what's being debated, what's being disagreed upon, and how deep that disagreement goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, really an interesting passage. Uh, one I didn't think I was going to be emotionally involved with when like I am with some of the others, mm-hmm. but I, I did find this one to be stimulating at a different level, where Jesus is obviously having a conversation about the nature of holiness, and uh, he's having a conversation that uh, brings to the fore perhaps what might be the most revolutionary portion of the New Testament when seen through Hebrew eyes. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of sitting in the back of a bus somewhere in the state of Israel, my first trip with the Anti-Defamation League of of Connecticut. And uh, I was sitting next to a rabbi who told me, he was asking me where I went to seminary, and I said, you know, the Berkeley Divinity School at Yale. And he said, oh, I I went to the Yale Divinity School. And I was like, huh? (laughs) And he said, oh, yes. I said, what did you get? He said, I I got an STM because... It is in the New Testament that we primarily learn about the life of the Pharisees. The Josephus does bring up the Pharisees, but if you want to know about Pha- Pharisaical Judaism, you have to read the New Testament. That's where mm-hmm. all the news is. And he launched into that. And uh, just to give, say one more thing about it before I hand it over to, to you, to anybody, just to give a little ba- bit of background here, and this is what I found so stimulating. So we, because I, years ago, I tried to track all this stuff down, like the washing of pots and things like that. I was like, where is all this stuff? Is it in the book of Leviticus? And I couldn't seem to find it anywhere. And it's because I misunderstood what they're talking about here, which is the tradition of the elders, mm-hmm. elders being ancients, not people who run synagogues, mm-hmm. you know, ancients 
like Hillel, and that this oral tradition rose up. And in the fourth and fifth century, it was the scribes. They be, we became, came to know them as scribes. And then the Pharisees, being a, uh, kind of like the elite of religious, really tried to fulfill this myriad of rules as they tried to apply temple holiness to everyday life and then decide between what is sacred and what's profane. And and in the process, this stuff wasn't written down until the Mishnah in really the third century. So this stuff, somehow I missed a lot of this message when I was in seminary, unlike my friend Rabbi Eric. Mm -hmm. I I didn't catch all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think whenever you see words like tradition of the elders or human tradition, like Jesus calls it later, or, you know, precepts of man, they're like synonyms for how the yeah. that whole body of canon law, like you're talking about, that was set alongside the Torah and how, how the Torah was to be applied practically. And by Jesus' time, it was such a heavy burden. Yeah. And um, even in Matthew, it says it outright. I, I wrote down that Matthew passage somewhere where it says, they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others, mm-hmm. but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. You know, they referring to the Pharisees yeah. who apply this law to the people. And um, and also, the, you know, this idea of washing every time they visit the marketplace and stuff, mm. um, they make such a demonstration of, you know, how the law is... is one, one commentator I read about this said it's like building a fence around the law to protect it from, you know, careless violation, that even if they just come near the market, they would have to rush home and wash, and they couldn't eat any produce from the market. So they, they, they served as like a middleman to the, sometimes the Gentile producers of all this produce that, that people would buy in the marketplace. Oh, interesting. Um, and so the idea that the disciples wouldn't wash, um, you know, it, it, the, the careless violation might be they bought produce made, you know, produced by Gentiles or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but the idea was that it became a protection that promoted tribalism, you know, separation and ice and all that division. And, you know, this is the tradition Jesus rejects and, and objects to in this passage is the tradition of the elders, because it is such a burdensome thing. And his whole MO, his whole reason for being is to fulfill the law with love and not with division. So I think that this is a really interesting heightened passage for that reason. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's controversial. Like even to our de- to this day, we still like to have our clean and unclean kind of definitions laid out. We being the church universal, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we the world. can probably come to that about how does that yeah. verse eight apply to us. But it, it's oh, you know uh, interesting. I mean, even the, the 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 the. It's hard for us to imagine this. I yeah. mean, the wild particular, like washing your hands with your fist. So I read about washing oh, your hands with your fist mm-hmm. and not using your fingers. And so you'd have to have somebody to water, to, to, to pour the water and then you do this fist thing again and then, then you do it this way and this way. I mean, it's all laid out. Like surgeons. And, and get, like surgeons. <laughs> and guess what? It's not only, it's not hygienic. It's ceremonial to be prepared for God. And, and you have to have somebody to do it. And yet they have ceremonial jars for cleansing, which is right out of the wedding of Cain of Galilee. John 2 verses 1 to 11, the water into wine. These are the water jars that were used oh, wow. for the ceremonial washing of hands. I mean, it, it, so this is where it is all there. It was part of Jesus' world. And sometimes if we don't, if we don't get what he was getting at, we don't really get it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the error of the Pharisees, their legalism um, obviously is not confined to the Pharisees and didn't end with the Pharisees. Mm-hmm. And uh, it still uh, sneaks up um, and... Uh, we're, we're more prone to it the less um, we're aware that, that we are liable to be Pharisaic as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, their whole approach to holiness, Peter, you're saying that this is a question about what is holiness, yeah. um, is radically divergent from Jesus. Uh, ph- Pharisee, the etymology of the word Pharisee is, is to set apart, mm. uh, to be separate from, which is very similar to the etymology of, of holy, um, to be, mm. to be yeah. set apart, which is very interesting. And I, I remember us talking on uh, one or more of the podcasts going through John's Last Supper discourse where mm-hmm. Jesus is talking about, um, you know, the high priestly prayer and, and praying to the Father for the unity of, of his followers. And the holiness that Jesus is talking about, there is a certain sort of setting apart, but it's being, a set, being set apart by love. 
uh, that there's a radical way of love that Jesus calls his followers into, and of course that Jesus embodied. Uh, and that is sort of true holiness, a true set apartness. And paradoxically, it's the sort of set apartness that leads us to stay very close to the world and not to be cut off from the world and not to judge the world and not to condemn the world. Uh, but the Pharisaic holiness and set apartness uh, is very exclusionary, very narrow, very uptight, very clenched, uh, very anxious. Mm-hmm. And I don't see any love in it as it's depicted in the New Testament. And Jesus clearly didn't see any or nearly enough love in it either. And that's the heart of the issue that, you know, as Jesus says elsewhere, um, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. But the Mm -hmm. Pharisees have that totally backwards. They Mm -hmm. see, they put law and discipline above human beings. And and that's, I think, the heart of of the issue here. For for Jesus, all of the disciplines, all the regulations, all all that is so the person can grow. I mean, as we would say, grow in Christ. Um, And uh, this narrow legalistic way uh, just doesn't allow for that. Well, yeah, I mean, it, the, the worst of it is it gets, um, you know, sort of like OCD, religious yeah. OCD. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a positive element. They were they were seeking holiness. Um, I, but I, but it is question, you know, that back to the sentence here where it says, then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile Mm -hmm. and that you know in the in the context of 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 hebrew piety that's a that is like such an enormous uh, revolutionary statement that uh when you take a look at that would be like somebody calling in all of our piety now the way we the way we are Mm -hmm. and saying you know you guys have totally missed it Mm -hmm. and and that's a little bit of what this is like a a kind of this is a grand miss but i think that one of the things that it's important for us to keep in mind that this is not a throw-off line uh in in one maccabees in the maccabean period is is not everybody's in touch with the maccabean period but the syrian king wanted to root out all jewish life and this is uh, a lot to say about that but uh Mm -hmm. it says in one maccabees Uh, It says, uh, but many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or to be profaned by the Holy Covenant. And they did die. In other words, when Jesus is saying this, he's talking about things that are not just issues of piety that we might get over. People in the tradition have died over these Mm -hmm. questions. This is a major, Mm -hmm. this is a major, you know, gauntlet glove drop here. Mm -hmm. Big time. Mm. Yeah, and not so recent, not so far off in our recent past with Christianity either. I mean, Salem witch trials. There oh. were there were all sorts of people executed for defiling moral code, oh. in our own tradition. If I had hair, it would stand on end. Yeah, we could do really this chilling. whole thing about about Christianity mm-hmm. and talk about how we have killed our own people, so mm-hmm. to speak, our own tri- so-called tribal people. We just killed them because mm-hmm. they didn't meet our standards, yeah. mm-hmm. whosever standards they were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's shameful. I think I, I've heard it said, and I think it's right, that the best argument against Christianity or said another right. way, the biggest, biggest stumbling block, the most valid stumbling block to coming to Christian faith is the behavior of Christians. Yeah. For sure, <laughs> for sure, uh, for sure. Yeah, 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 and that's that's just... I mean, that's why Gandhi it didn't come in farther. He said, that, you know, Gandhi understood that Jesus, he said, Jesus has got it. And mm-hmm. then he mm-hmm. went to an Anglican church <laughs> and uh, had to sit in the balcony. Oh, mm-hmm. God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Peter, what you're saying, I think, is so important to, to bring into this conversation that, um, that this is a really raw issue because uh, people had died to preserve their Hebrew, Israelite, Jewish identity. And then that... For me, that that gives me some compassion for the Pharisees because this fixation on observing the external, visible particularities of being the people of God as they understand it Mm kind of comes out of trauma and profound loss, right? Mm. Yeah, Um, and fear. Yeah, fear of things passing away. And Jesus, no doubt, sees that, and yet they don't get a pass, as we were talking on camera. (laughs) They don't get a pass. Yeah. Which right. is really interesting. I think, can, yeah. oh, you go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah. But I, I think what we're what we're seeing here is evidence of Mark and time and community because it's yes. really the earliest pangs of separation mm-hmm. of you know the following the Jesus way and those people getting kicked out of their synagogues yeah. and all this um, division and also the 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 this beginning of uh, like Gal- of Gentile 
mission and yeah. how in the Gentile world application of the law was much, much looser and much less, um, you know, much more liberal, I guess you'd say. And we get a lot, most of that in Peter's, I mean, in um, Paul's writings that are predate yeah. Mark. Um, and even that story of Peter who has a dream of all the food coming down on a cloth and mm. cloven hooves and everything. And the, yeah. the messenger of God says, none of this is unclean, eat freely, you know? Right. And he's like, what? So, I mean, this is all swirling, I think. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Um, yeah. I love that you brought that up because oftentimes we don't, we don't add Mark into the, the Pauline acts of the apostles drama over the inclusion of Gentiles into the holy people of God. Uh, and, and how painful that was mm -hmm. for everybody. And uh, and I was I I read recently that the Mark's telling of the feeding of the five thousand, the feeding of the four thousand, the two stories of the multiplication of loaves, are intended because Mark had a mixed congregation to say that one of those is told in mosaic terms to the Hebrew people, and the other is told in more Gentile terms with Elijah and Elisha to the to the Gentile people. And it was the idea that you you'd have to understand both the revelation to and the inclusion of. Jews and Gentiles to understand the fullness of the, the project that Jesus had in right. his coming. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, even here, the very next verse in 24, Jesus moves on to Tyre and Sidon, and oh, yeah. he meets the Syrophoenician woman who's a Gentile mm -hmm. yeah. woman, and she's the one who famously tells him, you know, even the dogs oh, right. get the crumbs from mm -hmm. under the table. Story. So here's Jesus illustrating this controversy, controversy, and that's why in the beginning I, I said not the disciples didn't even like what he was doing because he drags them along and they're like, what are you doing? You know, and he, um, in that story, he, her faith is sort of contrasted with all this opposition he's yeah. getting from his own people. Yeah. And um, so I think he's, you know, Jesus goes right out deliberately to illustrate what he's talking about, that, you know, people can all be invited to God's table um, because it's not about the food. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to get to that passage. There's a lot to say yeah. about that. Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's kind of a shame we yeah. have to, like, read them all out of context, yeah. you know, but right. can't read the whole of Mark on a Sunday morning. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is one passage here, because, as you know, the pericope cuts out two things. It cuts out a thing on Corbin, yeah. which we can just yeah. leave yeah. out. Or maybe, John, you've got something to say about helpful. that. Well, it doesn't... Um, I, I, the omitted verses don't ever come up in the lectionary, so yeah. I think we should. Oh, I there's there's we'll one omitted verse here. that I'm yeah. dying to talk about. It's not the Corbin verse, oh. and I'm go for it. Okay, <laughs> uh, I, 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 this is this is uh, you know when the lectionary leaves out something that is so salient, so good, and so direct, and speaks to us so much. This was left out when he had left the crowd and entered the house. His disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them. Then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach, and it goes out into the sewer? Mm -hmm. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles. And as you guys know, I worked in the sewer department when I was in high school, <laughs> and I love the sewer department. I love all things sewage. And so they took out the word sewer from the lectionary. We should have the word sewer in the lectionary. It's superhuman, super graphic, because this is how the human body works, right? And his distinguished mm -hmm. between what comes out of the body and what comes out of the heart. I just think yeah. this was such a great emphasis on the syllable with such mm -hmm. an exclamation point. Oh, yeah. They should have mm -hmm. left this passage yeah. in. Yeah, uh, I agree. They must have thought it, they must have been too... Uh, prickly to have this yeah. public proclamation i, guess I don't so. know <laughs> i mean it's the bible what do you expect mm -hmm. there's all sorts of stuff in there yeah. uh yeah yeah what a, what a shame that's omitted um this is such a challenging passage for me for for reasons we've already discussed and another one is that um you know of course jesus and the pharisees are disputing um the interpretation of scripture, the interpretation of tradition, how to weight scripture versus tradition. And it's, it's almost like it's easy enough when it's a matter of the washing of hands and of these vessels, because Peter, as you were saying, um, that I, I actually don't think that part is in Leviticus. In my preparation here, the closest I could find is in Leviticus chapter 15. There are laws um, for uh, what to do if you come into contact with some sort of bodily discharge. But that doesn't cover the situation here. That's not what's going on here. So this is part, therefore, of the oral Torah, uh, which, as, as yep. we said, later got written down as the Mishnah, and then that, that's part of the Talmud. But at this point, it was an oral tradition. Um, but when it comes to the dietary restrictions, which we've already talked about a little bit, that stuff absolutely is 
in the written Torah. It is in the scriptures. And Jesus is actually, according to Mark here, moving beyond that in quite a radical way, declaring all foods clean. Um, so it's not only a dispute about, you know, uh, fidelity to scripture versus tr- fidelity to human tradition, although it is that, but it's also about the interpretation of scripture itself and what how it applies, um, in this case, in their time, uh, which I find super interesting, mm-hmm. super challenging. Sort of, sort of get it, Jesus is hermeneutic yeah. for interpreting scripture. Well, I read that the hand-washing uh, originated as a commandment to the priest who had mm. to, when they went into the high you know, the inner sanctum had to wash three times and there was ritual washing and then it spread to apply to all people according to the the Mishnah that grew up around it, but that could be not not correct. But it's something like that, that it was originally yeah. a priestly thing. Um, and also, I think that the, the other passage that is left out of here, the Korban piece, um, the Korban is a word that appears in the section that's cut out um, and Jesus is trying to argue with the the Pharisees that, you know, the, the way they set aside God's command, as Jesus puts it, um, in order to observe their own tradition, meaning this, this oral tra- canon law that's risen up, he points out to them that Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father mother, or mother as Korban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition. And, he, and Jesus says, and you do many things like that. So he's like, and the Korban idea is that people could dedicate their fortune or their estate to the temple upkeep and bypass, you know, giving it to their family. And, and they were commanded to take care of their parents when they became elderly. So Jesus says that a lot of them were guilty of neglecting their parents in order to, you know, appear, I don't know, maybe appear holier right. by giving everything to the temple. Um, but then there went the elderly, you know, neglect of the elderly. Mm-hmm. And so I think that passage is quite helpful and it was also cut out, but it, it shows more clearly how Jesus is ob- objecting to the way they're applying the law to, yeah. to their people. So, yeah, yeah, that's how you make sense out of verse eight, where it says you abandon the commandment of God and, and oh, yeah. hold to him. That's yeah. what, that's what makes sense of that. Yeah. I want to come back to something you just said, John, and, and it's something you've talked about in the past also, uh, uh, in our previous podcast, and it is, uh, it's, this is from some of the, uh, that's an excised pericope, the, the, the piece that's not there, but it says, thus he declared all foods clean, mm-hmm. and you're bringing up the question of the hermeneutic, how do we read this, how do we understand this, what was Jesus doing, and of course now, we have so many layers on this thing, and one of the things we have, womp womp, we have biblical hermeneutics ourselves that we, you know, <laughs> a lens that we put on it, and there's a, there's a biblical theologian, an Irish biblical theologian that I love to listen to, and because he has such a great lilt in his voice. And uh, he was saying that uh, he joins a long list of scholars who believe that this grew out of the Markan community and that Jesus didn't actually say, thus he declared oh, all foods clean kind of thing. Because this, this, what this biblical theologian said was, let's face it, he didn't say it in such Americanism as let's face it, but that Jesus for almost the whole of the ministry that we have a record of was with Jewish people and that he likely kept the Jewish food laws like almost all of the time. He Clearly he messed around with the Sabbath but with things like that, healing people on the Sabbath, but that uh, and that this this one set of biblical theologians think that this is the Mark and Redactor writing into this. Hmm. How are they going to solve having a community of of Jewish people and Gentile people together? And, mm-hmm. and this. so anyway, but back to yeah. I mean, and I don't know the answer to it, right, but right. back to hermeneutics and how do we think about what's happening? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think that that very well could be because Elizabeth, as you pointed out, this was very much a live debate in the time of Paul, and we see it in Acts and in Paul's letters. And mm-hmm. uh, he disagreed with Peter, and he disagreed with James, and it was it was a huge thing that clearly was not settled for the Jesus movement, that is, the disciples um, mm-hmm. in Jesus's lifetime. Yeah. It's still possible he like got that message across, and they didn't get it because that wouldn't be the only mm-hmm. time. But Mark is thought to be written to a Gentile audience, precisely. I mean, there are other reasons, but one of the 
big reasons is the explanation of the Jewish practices here in yeah. the text. Yeah. It wouldn't be necessary for an all Jewish or mostly Jewish audience. Right. Good. Uh, That's such a yeah, great Yeah, and this gets into the yeah. question of like, what should we do with our podcasts going forward? Should we bring in Paul? Should we have a whole thing, you know, on and on and on? And <laughs> did Paul create Christianity and these whole questions? And But you may notice like in the Pauline writings, Paul doesn't quote Jesus very often. And he does not quote Jesus about food. Mm. Mm-hmm. So these they're, these people are they're 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 as generation two of the Jesus movement. Mm-hmm. They're they're making things up, mm-hmm. not making up. They're they're following the Spirit, reading the Hebrew Scriptures, mm-hmm. looking at traditions, the elders, mm-hmm. looking at how you their their vision of 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 a universalism, mm-hmm. a universal mm-hmm. salvation. How do mm-hmm. you get it all to fit together? Right. Well, it doesn't necessarily come from the words of Jesus mm-hmm. and what they can track on right. what Jesus right. said. Mm-hmm. And it's Peter who's sent to the Gentiles between Paul and Peter. So. Mm-hmm. You know, Peter has the vision, and I, I think that that's the, the yeah. simultaneous kind of, uh, it's not a split, it's, an, it's a settlement, like an agreement that, you know, <laughs> we're going to do all this, but you take care of that because I don't really want to get my hands dirty, right? Or something like that. Yeah. And they agree that this is what God is telling Peter to do. Yeah, but um, wow, that's for another uh, yeah. another episode. Okay, so you know, we're almost done. <laughs> Rob must want to. I can't see Rob so easily today, so I don't see the signs. It's telling. He says it's tell, time to, cl- to clear Peter, the table and wash Peter the dishes. Tell Peter to be quiet. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but imagine this. I mean, okay, let's just get a look at how big a deal this passage is. Imagine if we were contending with our understanding of Christianity needs to take in a whole different religious doctrine, which is what this is, a whole different religious doctrine than we are accustomed to, and could we integrate it into our doctrine? Because that's what's happening here. Mm -hmm. This is the inter, you know, it's a Jewish story here, and now we have Jesus as the bringer of the Jewish story and new doctrine, Mm -hmm. and how these things get integrated together. And it's hard and challenging. Well, we know that. I mean, ordination of women, you know, this is the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. I think that was a humongous, divisive controversy that Mm -hmm. Yeah, good call. Was you know, violent in many pockets and remains yeah. super controversial. So I think yeah. that's a, that's good a call. very that is big good equivalent. Call. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, well, it is time to wrap up, but one last well, thought, John. Uh, sh- should we talk about the list of vices at the end? I feel like we have to touch that. Be like it's Labor Day weekend. A lot of people might be busy doing I'm so disinterested. In, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so disinterested in lists of vices. It's really funny. Uh, you know, I mean, lists of vices. This was, this was, they're all over the New Testament. They're all over the philosophical world. I, I read, I read the Greek words for each one of the vices and what the vices actually mean. I, I woke up earlier this morning and, uh, and that's what I did. And at the end of it, I was like, ah, okay. You got something to say about these vices? Well, I think these are things that, that, that are dispositions and ways of the heart. And Jesus is yeah. trying to call them out as not the things that, that happen when you eat dirty food, you right. know? And I think he's trying to contrast between the body and the heart here. And he's not necessarily being a, a you know, pious Puritan. He's mm-hmm. just saying, you know, here's the stuff we should really be concerned about. Yeah. And they come out of your heart. Agreed. Yeah. I just, I think it's an important counterbalance to um, Jesus's, um, what can sound like Jesus's disregard for discipline and oh, yeah. rules and so on that Jesus does still care about what we do. And mm-hmm. it's not just like, oh, I'm, I'm loving, therefore I can do whatever mm-hmm. I want. Um, yeah. And they're the 10 commandments embedded it, in there. That's very true. That, that's really all. That's I, good. I, I didn't feel like I, didn't I need catch to say that about the, the vices, the Greek words for, mm. for sex and things like that, which is all embedded in there. Yeah, like faithlessness, yeah. you know, yeah. stealing, adultery, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, there we go. I, any any final, you know, beautiful thoughts? No. no. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone, on this uh, pre-holiday week weekend. Um, we are so glad you join us every week, and we're thrilled to be together for another podcast, and we'll see you in church. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm.